Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Akshay Jain, an endocrinologist in Vancouver, British Columbia, and joining us today is Dr. Christopher Gardner, a nutritional scientist at Stanford. He is uh, the author of many publications, including the widely cited Swap Meat Study, and he was also a presenter at the American Diabetes Association Conference in, in San Diego here in 2023. So we'll be talking a little bit more about his work and the presentation that he did that looked at classification of different kinds of diets and also the pluses and minuses of a plant-based diet versus an animal-based diet. Welcome, Dr. Gardner. Great. Glad to be here. So let's get right into this. Uh, there's obviously been a lot of talk about this, both in the lay media as well as in the scientific literature, plant-based diet versus animal-based diet. When it comes to an individual living with diabetes, does one kind of diet make more sense versus the other? Well, I think this is one of these false dichotomies. And so it's really not all one or all the other. And two of my favorite sayings are with what and instead of what. And so if you're, if you're thinking, okay, animal-based, so I'm, I'm really going to go for this. I know it's low carbs. I have diabetes. I know animal foods have few carbs in them. Well, that's true. But think of some of the more and the less healthy animal foods. Yogurt is a, is a great choice for an animal food. Fish is a great choice for an animal food with omega-3s. Uh, chicken McNuggets, not so much, right? And so then you switch to the plants. I said, oh, I've heard all these people talking about a whole food plant-based diet. That sounds great. I'm thinking broccoli and chickpeas. But I know there's somebody out there saying, I just had a Coke. Isn't that plant-based? I just had a pastry. Isn't that full of plants? And so it doesn't really take much to think about this, but it's not as dichotomous as animal versus plant. Great. No, that's, that's really good. Obviously, a very good uh, understanding there uh, regarding what actually constitutes the diet. Um, from the cardiovascular perspective, there's been a lot of talk lately. Initially, uh, people saying that animal-based diets are really bad from a cardiovascular perspective, and now some studies suggesting that it may not be true. What's your take on that? So again, if you think with what or instead of what, <clears throat> Microbiome is a super hot topic. That's really fiber and fermented food. That's really only plants. Um, saturated fat, you know, despite all of what appears to be controversy, saturated fat raises your cholesterol, your blood cholesterol. It's, it's more prevalent in animal foods than in plant foods. Um, are there any great nutrients in animal foods? Sure, there's calcium in dairy products for osteoporosis, but that's not so much diabetes or heart disease. Uh, there's iron. Well, actually, people can get too much iron, which is a, can be a pro-oxidant in levels that are too high. Uh, protein, we're probably going to get to protein later, so I'm going to pass on that for now. There's really, you know, in a, so the American Heart Disease in particular, which I'm very involved with, came out with new guidelines just in 2021. It was very plant-focused. The top of the list was vegetables, fruits, whole grains. And the fourth item was protein. And when it came to protein, it was mostly from lentils and beans and grains. So that's, that's really good to know. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about protein. You know, um, we, we often hear about this, how somebody on a plant-based diet only can never have all the essential amino acids and also the amount of protein that one needs, uh, whether it's for general everyday individuals versus even more so for athletes or bodybuilders. Um, you cannot get enough protein and good quality protein from plant-based diet. Um, is there any truth to that? Or, and um, if not, then you know, what would you suggest for athletes as well as general everyday individuals on a plant-based diet? Yeah, no, this one drives me nuts. Please stop obsessing about protein. <laughs> this isn't a very scientific answer, but go watch the documentary Game Changers, which is all about vegan athletes. There's some pretty hokey things in that film that are very unscientific. But let's just go back to basics since I don't have an hour and we only have a couple of minutes together. It is a myth that plants don't have all the amino acids, including all nine essential amino acids. I have several YouTube rants about this if anybody wants to search Gardner Stanford protein. All plant foods have all nine essential amino acids and all 20 amino acids. There is a, a modest difference. And what it is is grains tend to be a little low in lysine and beans tend to be a little low in methionine. 
But part of this has to do is how much of a difference does a little low mean? So if you go to protein requirements that were written up in 2005 by the Institute of Medicine, you'll see that the estimated average requirement for adults is 0.66 grams per kilogram body weight. And that's actually ends up being for women about 45. Oh, sorry, that's that's just the estimated average requirement. I'll clarifier there. If we recommended the estimated average requirement for everyone and everyone got it, by definition, half the population would be deficient. So we have recommended daily allowances and the recommended daily allowances include two standard deviations above the estimated average requirement. Why would we do that? It's a population approach. So if that's the goal and everybody got it, you'd actually still have the tail of the normal distribution that would be deficient, like two and a half percent. But the flip side of that argument is how many would exceed their requirement? That's 97 and a half percent of the population would exceed their requirement if they got the RDA. Okay, so the RDA translates to about 45 grams of protein a day for women and about 55 grams of protein a day for men. Men and women in the U.S. get 80, 90, and 100 grams of protein today, a day. And what I hear them say is, you know, I'm not sure if I need the RDA. I feel like I'm extra special or I'm above the curve, and I want to make sure I'm getting enough. The RDA already has a safety buffer in it. It was designed that way. Uh, so flip to athletes just for a sec. Sure, athletes want to um, have more, be more muscular and, and make sure they're supporting their activity. But the data we have suggests, this is from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, that not 0.66 grams per day, not 0.8 grams per day, that's the RDA. Americans get like 1.2 to 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram body weight per day, which is like double. Athletes don't eat as many calories as the average American. If they're working out to be muscular, they're not eating 2,000 or 2,500 calories a day. I have a Rose Bowl football player, player um, teaching assistant from my human nutrition class at Stanford, and he logged what he was eating for his football workouts. He was eating 5,000 calories a day, and he was getting 250 grams of protein a day without any supplements or shakes or anything. He's just eating food. And so I really do think this whole protein thing is a myth. As long as you get a reasonable amount of variety in your diet, it is no problem meeting your protein needs. Um, vegetarian, absolutely no problem because they're getting dairy and some eggs and things, but even vegans are likely fine. They would have to pay a little more attention to this, but really, I know a lot of very strong, healthy vegans. This is so helpful, Dr. Gardner. I know a lot of clinicians, including myself, uh, this will, we will find this very helpful, uh, including when we talk to our patients and counsel them on their requirements. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, final question for you. So we know of people that are on either side of the extreme, either completely plant-based or completely animal-based, but for majority of us that have some kind of a happy medium, um, what would your suggestions be as far as the macronutrient uh, distribution that you would uh, recommend from a mixed animal and plant-based? What would be the ideal recommendations here? You know, we did a huge weight loss study with people with prediabetes, and it was as low in carb as people could go and as low in fat as people could go. And that didn't end up being the ketogenic level or the low-fat vegan level. That ended up being much more moderate. And we found that people were successful either way on low carb and low fat. Interestingly, on both diets, protein was very similar. Let's not get into that since we just did a lot of protein. But the key was a healthy low carb or a healthy low fat. I actually think we have a lot of wiggle room there. So let me build on what you said just a moment ago. I really don't think you need to be vegan to be healthy here. So we, we prefer the term whole food plant-based. So if you're getting... 70, 80% of your food from plants, you're fine. If you, if you really want to get the last five or 10 or 15% all from plants, the additional benefit is not going to be large. You might want to do that for the environment or animal rights and welfare, but from a health perspective, a whole food plant-based diet 
leaves room for some yogurt and some fish and maybe some eggs for breakfast instead of those silly high carb breakfasts that most Americans eat. I will say on the very high animal side, uh, animal foods have no fiber. And given what a hot topic the microbiome is these days, the higher and higher you get in animal food, it's going to be really hard to get antioxidants, most of which are in plants, very hard to get enough fiber, which is good for the microbiome. And so that's why I tend to fall along the lines of a whole food plant-based diet that leaves some room for meat and animal sourced foods, which you could leave out and be fine, but I wouldn't go in the opposite direction in the all animal side. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Gardner. Um, final pearl of wisdom here. When clinicians like us see patients with diabetes, what do you think should be the final take home that we can counsel our patients about? Yeah, great question. So I don't think it's really so much animal or plants. It's actually type of carbohydrate. There's a great paper at a, a JAM in 2019 or 2020 by Shan et al. And they looked at the proportion of calories, not just from proteins, carbs, and fats over about 20 years. They looked at the subtypes. And very interestingly, protein from uh, animal foods is about 10% of calories. Plant is about 5% monopoly and saturated fat are all about 10% of calories. High quality carbohydrates are about 10% of calories. What's left there? 40% of calories from crappy carbohydrates. We eat so many calories from added sugars and refined grains that, and those are plant-based, right? Added sugars and refined grains are plant-based. So in terms of a lower carbohydrate diet, there is an immense amount of room for cutting back on that 40%. What would you do with that? Would you eat all more animal food? Would you eat all more plant food? This is where I think we have a lot of wiggle room. So if the patients could get rid of all or, or most of that 40%, they could pick some eggs and yogurt and fish and some high fatty foods. They could pick avocados and nuts and seeds and, and olive oil. Or they could have more broccoli and more chickpeas and more tempeh and more tofu. So there really is a lot of wiggle room. The key is, can we please get rid of the elephant in the room, which is plant food? It's all that added sugar and refined grain. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, Dr. Gardner, uh, for joining us today. Uh, you're one of the speakers at the ADA 83rd conference in San Diego in 2023. And uh, hopefully we get to hear more from your group in the future. Uh, this is Akshay Jain uh, signing off for Medscape. Been a pleasure, Akshay. Thanks.